This is a really important dye flower. This is Coreopsis tinctoria. This is like, like a really high quality orange. I finished writing a book last year and it was called Harvesting Color. And I had gone all around the country researching different dye plants from the different bioregions in North America. This is the Polygonum tinctorium. This is the indigo. It's a Japanese indigo species. I found that there were not only incredible sources of color, natural color, but incredible sources of fiber. There seemed to be people popping up everywhere across the country, raising sheep, raising goats. And I thought, hmm, isn't it interesting that there's so much raw material, but we don't see it manifested on the backs of any Americans. This is from Mary Meadows Farm. I mean, as most you'll see is like someone knits their baby a pair of booties or, you know, they wear a scarf or a hat that they've knit from some wool from a local farm and maybe they dyed it in their fennel from out in the backyard. I'm finishing up a new bathing suit. <laughs> These are my bathing suit bottoms. <laughs> it's hand spun wool and it's modeled after my great grandmother's wool bathing suit. So it's just like what they used to, it's hand knit, hand spun, has a lot of stretch. So I'm finishing up a bathing suit top right now. You rarely see this holistic model of what bioregional clothing would look like. So I kind of just thought, you know, we need a working model. We need to see what it looks like. And I thought, well, you know, really what I'm talking about here, it's very synonymous with watersheds and food sheds. It, this is a fiber shed. This is about me researching and defining the geography of the land in which I can procure all of the raw materials for my clothing, meaning all of the fibers and all of the colors would come from within 150 miles of my front door. This is um, pokeberry. These will turn into little berries and it's the berries that make this dye. So I said, okay, we're just gonna, we're just gonna make this happen. And if anything, I will sit at my loom and I will just weave clothes from my own hand spun yarns. <laughs> well, that was A, not going to happen unless I wanted to be clothed any time in the next decade, just because of the amount of time everything took. B, it would have uh, taken away opportunities for local artisans and farmers to really participate with me and engage with me. So one of the weavers took Sally's cottons and she wove it with some wool from one of the local farms that really only grows meat sheep and this byproduct wool she took and she wove with the cotton. And this is from sheep only about 20 miles away. Cotton, 90 miles. So this wardrobe is really about a collaboration between an individual local designer and an individual farmer. And their collaboration birthed each of these garments. These are the golden pants, I call them. Tara Srinivasan made these pants from Sally Fox's cotton that she had had milled way back before we lost all the mills and all of the processing. All of the fabric I'm wearing is from boxes that the farmer took out of her archives and said, I'd really like to see people make fabric again, but if I give this to you, will you make clothes out of it to show the world that we can do this ourselves again? that there's nothing new in what you're doing. So she gave me this fabric and it's from 1993. It was from when she had her farm, when she used to mill in Richmond, California. And all of this fabric is from vestiges of our manufacturing history that America somehow let go of because the profit margins weren't big enough. <laughs> and this wardrobe, I started that pair of pants. I was wearing those pants. This shirt, which is a shirt that I just sewed for myself uh, for six weeks, I just kept wearing the same thing over and over and over again. And I committed. I said, I'm not going to wear clothes outside of this radius. Sometimes I would just be in my house without wearing anything while this one item of clothing was being washed in my bathtub. So slowly the wardrobe evolved. Then came this item. My good friend Monica hand knit this piece with Sally Fox's boucle buffalo brown cotton. So the farmer's Sally, the knitter's Monica. This is a 97 mile shirt. Another one of the first pieces that came out that kept me warm. This is alpaca, it's 100% alpaca. It got me through the winter and then I met the animals. I went to the flock and I met the animals, Kachina, 
Blackberry, Celeste, all the alpaca who contributed to this. And they would started nuzzling the clothes because they could smell themselves. And then this sweater. Every time I put this on, I think of this sheep was named Daisy, and Daisy's not living anymore. And the 96-year-old farmer who's still ranching, who owned Daisy, and who has contributed to the project so much. Her name is Jean Near, and this is wool from her flock. And she's the oldest woman in the fiber shed. And then an 18-year-old designer, she's 19 now, she only had three skeins of yarn, which is a very little bit of yarn. Her challenge was to make me a sweater that I could wear in the springtime. And I dyed it in Toyon, which is a native California plant. This is also Daisy. So we had the youngest designer working with the oldest farmer. So the age was 18 and 96. And those, that generational span is what created this, along with the yarn from Daisy. There's a lot of people in this closet. <laughs> oh yeah, here, can I show you the map? Oh my gosh. This one wardrobe that you're seeing, all those red dots are all the different skills and all the names are the people who came together to make one wardrobe. You can see there's fiber farmers, knitters, weavers, designers, seamstresses, felters, spinners, cotton farmer, natural dyers, mill owner, we have one mill. The mill is right here. It's the Yolo wool mill. That closet was made by these people, and that's a map of our region. This is where we are, right here. This is that wool I told you was byproduct wool. It's over here. It's the closest wool to me. The second closest wool source is this farm. This is how it works. The urban center, meaning this is the Bay Area, houses all of this creative talent. Before this project, none of these people were professional clothing designers. This is all a community that's been established in the last 10 months. This just shows you how many resources we have available to us in terms of getting the needs, our needs met. There's people available. It's this whole like no job thing, economic downfall. I just, you know, like that, to me that's just understandable that people feel that way but it's also kind of short-sighted i know that we're in the emotion of like feeling like things are falling apart and um, i can totally understand that and it's not that i haven't felt that way sometimes myself but plants keep growing sheep keep breeding <laughs> the the world doesn't stop just because wall street lost a few points and we need to value the fact that we have a life beyond these really kind of computerized economic structures. Now we have the opportunity to be like, well, they're not representing our numbers and our figures, and so let's just disconnect from the fear and start making the things we need, and who cares who's measuring us or who's telling us what our worth or value is, we'll just provide for one another. <laughs>this is a felted skirt. This is by Catherine Jolda. She tans her own buckskin and she uses felt because it's it's a textile, probably the first textile other than skins. Uh, it's wool just agitated so it's not knit or woven. This is just raw wool, soap and water. This is the onion skin dyed vest. She felted it on the back of her bike. She rode her bike through Chrissy Field in San Francisco with this wrapped up in bubble wrap. And she poured hot water on it and she let this vest basically take all the bumps and the aggravation of being ridden down a bicycle path and all of that agitation felted the wool. So this is a completely like bicycle powered vest. Most of us are wearing 7-Eleven clothes. Like, you're, what you're wearing is like eating three meals a day at 7-Eleven. Do you want to eat three meals a day at 7-Eleven? No. So why would you wear three meals a day on 7-Eleven? This piece exemplifies all the dyes that I love from California. I don't need everyone in the world to live in a fiber shed. That wouldn't even be physically possible. What I'm asking for, though, is that we bring an awareness and a conscientiousness to the backstory of the garments. And that hopefully, like our food, we've turned the corner a little bit on food awareness, that we'll turn the corner on garment awareness as well. This is my homegrown indigo. This is my black walnuts. This is coyote brush, which is a native California plant. This is eucalyptus that we're always, you know, people are always trying to get rid of. And this is horsetail. 
the food and the fiber are coming from the same sources. That means that those processes that that fiber undergoes or that food undergoes, it means water was used, it means fuel was used, it means people were paid or not paid well. There's all these negotiations that happen to get something on your back. In this piece, this is the color of the alpaca, so this is no dye necessary. This piece, it's waterproof, so it was my raincoat, <laughs> because the water beads off of wool and alpaca. We wanted to give a face to the project that was just, where people could kind of identify with what I was wearing and say, you know what, that's possible for me. Even though some of these garments are like rough, like it was a first go, what was more important is that, that the wool got knit <laughs> and then that the colors from the plants got a canvas. And so you're almost done. Yeah, I'm gonna keep going. I can't imagine putting on other clothes. It would feel, feel like, it would feel like drinking Coke for breakfast. It would just feel not healthy or right on some level. I've tried. My mom was like, you have to keep this polypropylene like rain jacket in your closet. When I moved here, she stuffed it in the back. She was like, just in case it gets really wet. I never touched it. And the other day I touched this material and I was just like, there's no way I'm putting that on my body when this challenge ends. Like, this is my raincoat. <laughs> I don't need another raincoat. I'm happy.